I think a lot of times we think of our reptile and amphibian pets as coming from watery environments, you know, like the swamps, the rainforest. And it's true that many species we find either in the water or near the water. But in, in truth, they, they use the water as a means to escape from predators or as an area to breed in and, or to find food. And few of them actually stay wet. Most of them are quick to get back out onto the dry ground and into the warm sun, first chance they get. And that includes water snakes and, you know, basilisk lizards and even dart frogs and tree frogs, things that we associate very much with the water. I think too that you, people don't always realize that in the natural world, when it rains, like in the tropics, it might rain hard for an hour. But shortly after the rain stops, the sun is out, the wind is blowing, and that moisture dries up. In captivity, that doesn't happen. You know, whatever water we apply to a vivarium, oftentimes that water is there for a very long time. So when we design a simple bioactive enclosure, what I want to talk about today and describe today a little bit, one of the most critical things we have to do is look at water and how it's used, how we monitor it, you know, how we know when we're putting on too much or not enough. I think for the majority of keepers, the problem starts when they decide they want to do a bioactive system and they Google it or they go on Facebook and they see these beautiful vivariums, you know, that the moss and the tropical plants and the misting systems and the drainage layers. Well, the problem with that is that they're creating an environment that almost no animal lives in. That environment that they create that's wet all the time, 24 seven, that doesn't exist in the real world. Now, what the industry does is tell you here, buy this misting system, buy this fogging system, you know, buy this waterfall. And then in order to deal with all that water that you're putting in your vivarium, buy this drainage layer, you know, buy these special substrates. And before long, you're buying a whole bunch of stuff that's designed to deal with the problem that you created by simply putting too much water into the vivarium in the first place. So the first thing you need to do when you're building a simple bioactive vivarium is stop watering so much. Stop putting so much water in to the vivarium. There are better ways to create proper environmental conditions without the threats that arise from the traditional sopping wet bioactive vivarium. We can start with any enclosure, an aquarium, um, a PVC cage, and the substrate we'll use is miracle Grow potting mix, which despite what you may have heard is perfectly safe for our reptile and amphibian pets. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's pretty much a perfect substrate for a bioactive vivaria. This guy's been in it now for many months, 24 seven. To the miracle Grow, you can add, you can use it straight, you know, and not cut it. You can add up to equal parts of coarse sand, not a fine, uh, play sand, but of course builder sand. You're, we're, we're working to increase drainage with the sand, and that's why we want the coarse sand. Okay, adding plants. Um, you get home from the greenhouse or whatever, you, you can check them out, you know, see if they have aphids on them or spider mites under the leaves. And also, you, you know, some, some folks are concerned about pesticides being sprayed on the leaves. All you have to do is just with a big bowl of warm, soapy water, just rinse the foliage off, turn it upside down, rinse it off, then rinse it real well in clean water, and it's good to go. You don't need to quarantine plants, you don't need to wash the roots or anything like that. Fresh water, on the other hand, is critically important. I use aquarium gravel to ramp, you know, make little ramps in the water bowl so that the certain like dart frogs can get in and out more easily. I also tend to use one bowl inside the other so you can remove one for cleaning. And between the substrate and the animal, I will use a layer of gravel for any of my non-burrowing reptiles or amphibians. You can use pea gravel that you can get at the big box stores. It's really cheap. Um, you can use aquarium gravel. It's 20 times more expensive. Uh, but the, what it's doing is it's separating your animals from the substrate because even slightly damp substrate can cause infections in, in reptiles and amphibians. So we need that barrier. 
Then below the gravel, we need to make sure that the substrate itself is charged with water. So we'll put in a couple gallons of water in a 20 gallon tank, for example, or three gallons of water in maybe a 40 gallon or a four by two PVC cage. And this amount of water will be sufficient for probably two to three weeks, depending on all the variables, your ventilation, the plants, how deep your substrate is, all that stuff. I do use a hand sprayer. I think those are very useful. Um, I might spray a snake that's in shed a couple times, for instance. If there's poop on the, on the leaves, you know, in a frog's vivarium, I'll use a mister to spray it down. Uh, if there's a pile of snake poop on the rocks, I'll use it to kind of break that up. I, you know, spray it with a, a stream from the mister and uh, just generally use it to clean up, you know, to wash the walls off the, of the terrarium. But don't overdo it because you can end up with a soak wet soil again. So use it, you know, don't use it to try to humi humidify the air. That isn't going to work. So if we're not going to humidify the air, what we, what we can do is create these sort of microclimates or micro habitats using this, these surface features. This is not clutter. We don't just mindlessly clutter up the vivarium with stuff. You know, everything that we place in the aquarium or the vivarium should be considered. You know, we should, we should know why we're putting it in there. Is it providing a security gradient or a radiation gradient or a temperature gradient or a humidity gradient? It should serve a purpose and you should know what that purpose is. For example, the humidity under a leaf in this simple bioactive vivarium can easily be 95, 98%, much higher than the humidity right on top of the leaf. And you'll find that, for instance, with certain species that love high humidity, they'll be under these leaves quite often, unless they're out hunting or you know, pursuing a mate or something. The humidity within a well-designed snake hide, for example, can be you know, 75, 85%, something like that. Whereas the humidity right outside it can be 40%. You also want to check the humidity in, at different points around the cage. And you want to check the humidity over time. If you use these little Bluetooth hygrometers, for instance, you'll start to see that the substrate, as the substrate moisture dries down, the humidity in the hides, for instance, under the leaves, will also just start to dip too. When you see that, you've got to pay attention and you've got to use your fingers and feel down into that substrate and feel if that moisture is, you know, if it's evaporating away, you'll need to recharge the substrate with your gallons of water. I think it's an important point that your frogs, lizards, snakes, whatever you're keeping, will come to understand their enclosure, what they call spatial ecology. They'll know where the humidity is, where the warmth is, where the security is, they really will come to understand that. In fact, there have been studies done on wild populations of toads, I think cane toads in particular, where they show that they have dozens of retreats in their territory, and they know the conditions of each of those retreats. So if, it's, if there's a dry spell, for instance, they'll literally move to those more humid retreats. It's exactly what your animal will do. That's why these gradients are so critically important to set up and allow your animal to utilize them. You create one massively wet environment, there's no real gradation. So now you might think, well, my job is done here. I've created this beautiful bioactive vivarium. But in fact, really, your job has just begun because now you've got to sit and observe. You've got to watch the animal. You've got to watch how it interacts with its environment. And you've got to ask yourself, why is it doing those things? Why is it avoiding this place? Why is it staying over in this area? You know, what, what is it doing in response to the home that you've created for it? And you need to adjust things, right? If it's staying away from something, is it too hot? Is it too dry? You know, you've got to play around with these parameters and see what that animal can teach you. That's how we get better as keepers, by learning from the animals that we keep.